And we're going to try to keep all of our testimony to one minute each, please. Oh, you're going to do it right now? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, come on. Good afternoon. Do you want to speak too? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he wants to speak. <laughs> That's okay. Um, good afternoon, Manning, uh, Madam Chair and, and Senator Manning. Um, I just wanted to come on behalf of Early Start. Um, my son Bennett last year was diagnosed with an extremely rare uh, chromosomal disorder. And uh, the only reason we found out about it is because he was experiencing developmental delays. But as he got older, the delays became more and more apparent and greater. And once we had the diagnosis and he reached a certain point, we were notified of Early Start and Golden Gate Regional Center. And without that resource, I don't know where we would be today because he's doing speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and the therapist and our caseworkers that we have dealt with have been extremely helpful in helping him overcome the obstacles, um, giving me the resources and the tools to help him become the best person that he can, that I wouldn't know how to help him achieve his full ability and, and become a functioning human being without them. So I just want to come on behalf of them and let you all know that it's so important that they get the funding and the support from the government so that the children, all children and families who have, have the same experience that I have, have those resources available to them so they can, um, you know, live full productive lives and um, be full productive citizens. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your testimony. And very nice to meet your children too. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to have them. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee, uh, Rick Rollins on behalf of ARCA Association of Regional Center Agencies. Uh, first of all, uh, ARCA would like to go on record in strongly supporting the uh, eight uh, uh, issues that are outlined in the Lanterman Coalition letter. We're uh, very proud to be part of that coalition. I want to thank the coalition members and particularly the leadership of the Chair Tony Anderson from the ARC for uh, coordinating the efforts uh, in, in that way. I'd also like to just touch upon a couple of the issues that uh, were outlined in your analysis and were previously discussed. The first, uh, system sustainability. Uh, as you heard Secretary Dooley say, the Health and Human Services uh, system has incurred over $2 billion of cuts over the last few years. Uh, a billion of those dollars have been taken from the, uh, uh, the developmental disabilities system. Uh, we believe that the system is truly at the breaking point and we have solutions, uh, both short term and long term, to try to rebuild and invest in the future. First of all, uh, we're encouraging a 5% increase in uh, purchase of service budget and, op and operations uh, on an annual basis until such time as the department can uh, put together, along with help of the legislature, a cost-based um, program uh, to uh, uh, base our budgets uh, not on outdated modalities such as, of course, staffing formula and other ways of doing business, but truly on the cost that it, it, it takes to uh, do a business in this uh, uh, system and to provide a level of uh, competence um, and, and uh, programs to the people that we serve. Secondly, uh, early start, uh, ARCA last year uh, headed up with the strong support of the entire developmental disabilities uh, community, the uh, renewal of the Early Start program, one of the deepest and cruelest cuts that was made in the last few years was to the eligibility in Early Start. So it eliminated the at-risk kids uh, altogether out of the program. These are, uh, these are babies that are born to uh, 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 mothers who may have dr uh, drug issues, uh, preemies and others. Uh, those children are not even eligible at all for services. They are circling back into our system, of course. We're seeing three to five to seven-year-olds that are now showing up at the door of the regional centers for full eligibility criteria. Um, and of course, the second area was a developmentally delayed group, uh, many of which are children uh, who do later develop autism that could easily uh, be helped uh, to help mitigate that condition by the uh, restoration of early start. Restoration of early start is a top priority, not only at ARCA, but throughout the um, developmental disabilities community. Okay, and last please conclude. Oh, and, 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 and lastly, um, in a couple of days, uh, California will uh, celebrate Autism Awareness Month. It was something that was created by Peggy's old boss uh, and an old tired uh, legislative staffer 22 years ago, uh, not Peggy, myself, uh, who uh, brought the idea to Senator McCorkadale. It became uh, the model now throughout the country for uh, autism awareness. 
I, um, I, I mention it because just today um, the CDC has released new prevalence numbers in autism, a shocking 30 percent increase uh, from 1 to 88 two years ago to 1 to 68. Uh, one in 42 boys are now being uh, diagnosed in this country with an aut autism or an autism spectrum disorder. And I raise that issue because uh, the, the other issue I, on the, in the budget we'd like to discuss and give our position on is on the copay coinsurance. We think uh, these are uh, terrible impediments for families uh, having to uh, pay for these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, copays and coinsurance. ARCA uh, strongly uh, urges uh, adoption repeal of the, of the trailer bill language and instead require regional centers to pay uh, copay and coinsurance co payments for all families uh, uh, throughout uh, the system who uh, are, are eligible. Mr. Rollins, I'm very sorry. You have very important things to say, but I do have to ask you to conclude. And lastly, uh, on the deductible issue, we would like to see the uh, language uh, uh, be repealed and instead give regional centers flexibility to pay deductibles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Chair and members and staff, uh, my name is Kristen Jacobson. I'm with the Alliance of California Autism Organizations, um, and I'm also here as a parent. Um, uh, our organization supports uh, fully the Lanterman Coalition letter, so I'd like to start with that. Um, I want to personally just speak briefly about uh, the Early Start. All three of my children um, were uh, beneficiaries of Early Start, and it made an incredible, incredible difference to them. Uh, my son was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at six months old, and we told we'd be lifelong regional center clients. Well, I'm proud to say that as a nine-year-old boy, he runs and jumps and plays sports and is athletic, and none of my children need Lannerman services because of early start, and they wouldn't qualify today, and that is criminal. I mean, that mom who stood there and said how much it meant to her, I echo every bit of it. It was a lifesaver, and the fact that there are 12,000 families right now who are not getting that service is criminal, not to mention fiscally completely imprudent. If 10% if of the families who we don't serve with Early Start, which from before, the average you were paying per family in Early Start was eleven to $1,200. That was a total of $13 million to restore that program. If 10% of those families end up as lifelong Lanterman clients and end up having $2 million of life time costs, that's $3.6 billion, $3 billion, $55 million a year. It far exceeds the cost of paying for Early Start. Early Start's cost effective and it, it respects individuals and gives them the, the help when they need it. Um, so, so it's critical we do that. Uh, the other piece that I want to just touch on fiscally is the copay and deductible. Amer uh, Autism Society of California did a survey, which we presented at the Senate Select Committee hearing. Because of the cost of copay and deductible, 20% of individuals are dropping their children from insurance because they can't afford the copays and deductibles. And what that means is that the entire cost of the treatment for those children is being paid for by the regional center, and you're not getting the savings that you would of being able to use it through insurance. Another 20% are discontinuing ABA or dropping hours. That increases the lifelong cost of care for these individuals. So we strongly urge the legislature to repeal the language that was passed in the last budget trailer bill and replace it with the regional centers shall pay for copay, mm -hmm. coinsurance, and deductible for all IPP and IFSP services without means testing. It will save millions and millions of dollars. Yes. And the last thing I'd just like to turn into you, um, people have said it's, that it's impossible or very difficult to track deductibles to individual um, treatments and to regional center clients. It's not. That's just misinformation. Deductibles are tracked just as easily as co-pays. I have a sample here from Blue Shield. Every single insurance company has something exactly the same as this. So it is easy to track and will save millions of dollars. I think you're probably spending $60 million this year alone just on the families who have had to drop insurance. Thank, Thank you very much. We're looking oh, into... Oh, and Easter Seal said that they also support our positions. They had to leave early. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you. Melissa Cortez Roth, representing Autism Speaks. Autism Speaks is also a member of the Latterman Coalition, and we want to voice our support for all the items identified on their letter. I do want to focus my comments on the issue of copays and deductibles, and we've submitted our own letter on that issue, uh, requesting that the legislature reverse the policies in last year's budget trailer bill. Um, 
A couple of notes on that. We've seen challenges from families who can't afford co-pays and deductibles at the Office of Administrative Hearing. And what we're finding is that regional centers are still responsible for those services in the IFSP or IPP, even when the family can't afford the co-pay or deductible. So they are then, there's a delay in service. The regional center is being required to pay the copay, and in the case of deductibles, because of the prohibition, they're then being required to pay the full cost of service rather than having the insurance pick up part of that. Um, so we do support seeing that policy reversed. Um, I think it's also important to note that we want to make sure regional centers are actually required to make these payments. The existing law is permissive. It says that they may pay for families under 400 percent. And we've been informed of a couple of cases where families far below 400 percent of FPL were requested to pay that cost share. So we want to make sure that they're actually required to, to make this change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm very interested in what everybody has to say, but we have to stick close to one minute if you just see the line behind you to make sure we have an opportunity for everybody to speak. So, 63 thank seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Senator Corbett, nice to see you. Members of the committee, I'm Dick Fitzmaurice, president of the board of the ARC of California. After years of rate freezes and budget cuts, California's developmental services needs a lot of help. Today's reimbursement rates have very little to do with the cost of providing services, and it's critical that we return to a cost-based rate structure. But we cannot start with today's rates, or today's costs. Uh, they're artificially low. The 22 ARC chapters in California have survived, just barely, by cutting back. And cutting back initially, uh, looking only at critical tasks can be a good thing, but that time has long passed. Today our chapters rarely have a person on staff who has the skills to implement any new ideas for improving client services. In fact, we have very few people left to even think of new services, and those who do don't dare to mention it because if it costs any money, they'll get left out of the room. We need time to determine the baseline for a new rate structure. In the meantime, we urge you to invest in the future of the some 260,000 Californians with developmental disabilities by instituting immediately a 5% across the board annual increase in uh, the system that supports them. And in addition, as you have heard several times today, the ARC supports the recommendations of the Lanterman Coalition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Mark Pollitt, State Council on Developmental Disabilities. Uh, I'll provide details in a budget letter I'll give to the sergeant, but the council has 13 regional offices around the state called area boards, and we ask them to give us the pulse in their communities, what they hear from consumers and families in terms of the priorities that they feel for restoration of services, because there's a lot of decisions on what to spend money on first, and those are contained in the budget letter, but I want to double down on a couple of them, uh, early start and the copay, coinsurance, and deductible issue. Uh, these are things where if these things are not restored, children actually do not have their disabilities mitigated. People, children will develop disabilities, have lifelong functional limitations, and that's really sort of one of these cringe factor mm -hmm. uh, reductions we really feel ne needs to be focused on uh, very early, uh, right away. Uh, there's also the proposal to cap IHSS hours. And this would have tremendous disruption for families, you know, across the state, uh, thousands and tens of thousands of families. And so this is something the state should not go ahead and do. It's not a problem now, uh, but the disruption would be incredible. Thank you very much. Hi, Evelyn Abelkassen with Disability Rights California. I'm going to keep my comments brief. I submitted written comments to uh, Ms. Collins. Um, I want to echo the statement that Mark just made about the IHSS and the overtime issue. We think it's really critical that this get funded. Many of uh, people with developmental disabilities live at home with their families, where the families are the providers and really understand the unique needs of what these individuals need. Trying to substitute providers who really don't understand the ins and outs of um, the daily living that needs to happen for these folks and the needs that they have is not a good policy move. Um, I want to also align myself with the comments of Mr. Rollins around Early Start. We know that the um, administration scored about $19 million in savings when they took those Early Start reductions back in 2009. And we also know 
that we need to restore both the, the funding levels and the criteria to the pre-2009 uh, levels. Children who don't get served have future delays and have more problems, and we know that. And we also want to say that we want to see continued funding for the Family Resource Centers, who have played a critical role in the last few years to provide um, prevention and outreach services to these families. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Hello. Madam Chair and uh, Senator Mwani, my name is Lisa Rosine. I am the Chief of Regional Center Services for Golden Gate Regional Center. And as you heard, 43% of our system budget is from federal funds, approximately $2 billion. Uh, what you didn't hear was that the majority of that money is raised through case management activity. Our ability to hire adequate staffing is directly rated, related to the core staffing formula. Under that formula, um, we are allowed uh, $34,032 to hire a what they call a uh, client program coordinator, case manager, social worker. I cannot hire qualified staff in Marin, San Francisco, or San Mateo counties for that amount of money, and neither can anyone afford to live in those counties on that amount of money. Therefore, Regional Center has to augment what we're uh, allotted from the state uh, we start at $42,000, which is still abysmal. And I am currently losing staff at an alarming rate to the city and county of San Francisco, which starts their entry-level social workers at 60000 Plus, they're able to forgive their graduate student loans. So in or I was very amazed that there's nothing from the department in the current uh, budget proposal to update this formula, which has been in effect since 1991 and is based basically strangling our ability to hire uh, qualified staff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Paul Mitchell. I'm a social worker at Golden Gate Regional Center. I've been working there for 10 years. Um, I'll keep this short. Uh, you know, we're laboring under, how did I put it here in my notes, spirit breaking. Yes, you have my letter too. I'm going to say something a little different. Um, we're laboring under spirit breaking caseload numbers, really. I, when, I, when I started in 2003, I had 62 individuals that I worked with, and now I have 130. Um, and the, the other point is that uh, we are working for woefully inadequate salaries. Um, if uh, you were to update the core staffing formulas, if you were to champion that, we would be so, so grateful. Um, but uh, putting money into operations for the regional centers is really the point I wanted to make today. Um, and we're specifically asking for a 7.5% increase in operations budget, and that uh, number equals the number of unallocated cuts that have happened in the last few years. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Good afternoon, State Senators. My name is Maria Lydia Church, and I am a bilingual social worker, MSW, for Early Start Program, um, and I carry 80 cases. My families have asked me to represent them at the State Capitol. These are single parents, teenage parents, grandparents, foster care parents, working parents, parents living in shelters and living in single room occupancy with three to six children. These are parents who are str struggling with mental illness, substance abuse, chronic disease, poverty, lack of education, and domestic violence. These families not only struggle with their own issues, but also struggle to understand their child's disability. These families ask me, when will my child walk? When will my child talk? When will my child respond to his name? Call me mama. What is autism? Please help me. These are tough and heartbreaking questions. It's all a process. I am here today to ask you to increase the budget so we can continue to provide services for these families. By increasing the budget, we can recruit more qualified social workers, increase our hourly wages, which are way overdue, and decrease our caseload in half. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Lauren Marks. I'm an ongoing social worker, and my caseload has grown to 90 individuals, and unfortunately, I'm not able to provide the quality of service that individuals deserve or attend to individuals and families in a timely, efficient manner. I'm 
asking you to consider requiring lower caseloads to a manageable number by providing regional centers with increased operations budget with cost of living considerations so that we can hire, maintain, and nurture our dedicated staff and encourage continued high quality of care. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for the work that you do too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Holly Lean Bean on behalf of Children Now. Children Now remains in strong support of the Early Start Program and would like to see a restoration to pre-2009 levels in both funding and eligibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senator Monning. Sir, ma'am, um, my name is Evan Wong and I work with Golden Gate Regional Center in San Francisco, California. I'm actually an assessment social worker and I'm here on behalf of those who cannot speak up for themselves. Specifically, the majority of my cases are non-English speaking. Uh, and over the past few years, funding for the regional center operations has been unrealistic when compared to the actual cost. That is very unfortunate. My caseload has gone from a manageable 32 to a high of 42 last November, and two weeks ago it was 39, and it's climbing. For best practices, my caseload should be between 26 and 28. In addition to case management, I assist the clinicians with interpreting and translating because okay. we do not have adequate staff with bilingual and bicultural capabilities. While I assist the clinicians, my case management duties remain undone. Another negative outcome of my heavy workload is my inability to return messages, either electronic or telephonic. Before I can place the oxygen mask on others, I need to be sure I have one on myself. Please ask your colleagues to support and provide adequate and appropriate funding to the regional center system, and especially to the operations budget, including a geographical differential for higher or high cost areas. Pay back the 5%, add the 2.5% for the higher cost areas. On a more personal note, I am someone who cannot afford to live in the catchment area that Golden Gate serves, namely San Francisco, Marin, or San Mateo County. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Lynn Vaughn. I've been asked to read a statement by consumer Elizabeth Drake. She could no longer be here. My name is Elizabeth Drake, and I have cerebral palsy. Until the age of 17, I lived in hospitals and state facilities. I'm now an example of how an individual with physical handicaps has a successful and productive life by having the support I need in my community. I want to make it clear that I'm not a kid. I make choices for myself. I now work at Strategies to Empower People as the employer advocate working to help individuals succeed in their own lives, and that's why I'm here today. The proposed change to the exempt status, which has enabled our staff to fit the needs of the individual they serve, will drastically restrict choices available to us. We'll be limited by the changing of shifts and unable to plan activities which exceed staff work shift schedules. This drastic curtailment of our independence and freedom creates a type of house arrest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kevin Rath, and I'm from Manos Home Care. We serve um, over 1,000 clients in the East Bay. Uh, we're a member of uh, California Respite Association and California Disability Services Association. And we're, both of those associations are members of the Latterman Co Coalition, and we support the Latterman Act. I look forward to seeing uh, your staff in your office in San Leandro tomorrow. We're bringing some families, and we'll bring some documentation. Um, and I want to say that uh, um, I wanna, I'm here to support the, the um, a percentage based raise for respite care. Uh, it's the law, Title 17 requires it. And California right now is breaking the law, um, and we would like California not to break the law. Um, and we need it. Uh, 30 hours a month, that's what some people get for respite. How can you get a worker at minimum wage for a 30 hour a month job? Um, and, and especially and in daycare too, there are, it's just very, very difficult. The second thing I'd like to say is I certainly hope that the state will get um, what um, the department uh, said in writing regarding overtime that if two people are working for the same person that if one person is working for the same Person in the same home from two different agencies that there won't be a, a labor board ruling that says that they're doing overtime I hope that 
that the state gets that in writing from the California and the federal agencies that regulate that because um, if it doesn't and it starts happening, that will create chaos in the state. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Hi, Jamie Davis, Marin Ventures in San Rafael. Uh, I just want to say we're a member of California Disability Services Association and we support the Lannerman Coalition letter and the points outlined there about the budget. But I'm also here with Greg and he needed some moral support. <coughs> My name is uh, Greg Alexander D'Souza. I, I live in Marin County and um, I'm a, a worker at um, Marin Adventures, and I also play in a band called The Rippers. I play drums, and um, I'm here to, to just, you know, to um, stick up for everybody's right in here. When I say that we don't want any more budget cuts, and we don't want more, any more institutions, I think we all should um, live wherever we want, and nobody should take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for letting us come. Thank you very much. We're thank very you. happy to have you. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Barry Benda. And uh, actually, I had things to prepare to speak, but I'm going to forgo all of that because most everything has been said already. But I do want to uh, just state where I'm coming from and that I'm representing uh, the Service Provider Advisory Committee for Golden Gate Regional Center, and we're an organization of 60-plus agencies. Um, we have also developed a white paper, which is called Meeting Challenges and Moving Forward in the Developmental Disability Service System. A lot of what is in our paper, and you're going to have copies of that, is mirrored in the Landerman Coalition letter, which we strongly support. Um, and so I, we really feel like that in... Um, looking at all of the issues where, that we have looked at, that the underlying theme is that with the proper funding, we actually save money in the long term. So I think in the paper that we have, which gives some background and also some possible solutions, you will note that each, each of these areas, there are ways that, that we can save money by funding adequately. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sherry Roll, and for the past 28 years, I've had the privilege to serve as a social worker at Golden Gate Regional Center. Uh, I was first inspired in the mid-1980s by, by a number of Marin families who, in fact, had helped create the Regional Center System and the Lanterman Act. They were uh, taking their children, their adult children, out of the state hospitals, as they were known at the time, and placing, purchasing homes for them and setting up programs on their own. And many of these are still in operation today. Um, at that time, our caseloads were about 60 to 1. And with that ratio, we were able to provide what I consider quality, proactive services to families, to communities, and even developing resources. In the early 1990s, many of us were swept up in the Early Start program as it joined, as it entered the, the California system and the federal system. And at the regional center, I was involved in setting up Early Start and piloting it. And we started with a ratio of 50 to 1. At 50 to 1, we were able to provide a lot of direct services and also not just our mandated defined responsibilities, but hands-on being with families uh, when they're at a bedside in a, in a NICU unit, going to funerals, um, being there to provide support services for family members. Um, those ratios are now at 70, 80, and even more, 80 to 1 at the moment at our regional center area for early start. Um, the individuals and families we serve and those that came before them fought hard to create and maintain the regional center system and entrusted us with an enormous responsibility. To carry out this mission, though, we need to return to a staffing ratio that allows us to manage our multiple and growing responsibilities and does not exceed 62 to 1. We need to retain our experienced staff to serve as mentors and role models and provide an important historic link between the past, the present, and hopefully the future. But a lot of us have had to leave our home communities, take second jobs, and apply for public benefits ourselves, for our children, for ourselves, due to frozen wages and absent cost of living increases for many years. Others have left the regional centers seeking state positions or left the field altogether. We're now over two minutes, and I'm, I'm, you know, I hate to do this. I'm very interested in everything everybody has to say, but do you see the line? 
And we still have one more agenda item. I just want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak. So I'm very sorry to cut you off, but we really do need people to speak, speak close to a minute. Thank you. We're requesting the seven and a half percent increase and I'll stop there. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. Hi, my name is Amanda Pyle. I work with Horizon and Oasis Day Programs. And I'm also the co-chair of the GGRC Service Provider Advisory Committee representing San Mateo, San Francisco, and Marin Counties. We support the actions outlined in the white paper that you just received from one of the previous speakers, specifically but not limited to a budget that supports increasing provider rates by 5 to 10 percent, restoring early start and supporting employment funding, and increasing regional center operations by 5 to 7.6 percent. Service providers are continually asked to do more with less. Requirements around audits and employment are just a few examples. We are in support of requirements like these that help us ensure individuals in our service delivery system receive the best supports possible. But working off of extremely low rates makes it challenging to meet these additional requirements successfully. Our system needs a rate structure designed to sustain the system and to move the system forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.